Indeed, it's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker this evening. I'm a uh, veterinarian who spent the first part of my career specializing in horse practice, who came from a lawyer and family. Uh, my father was a lawyer, one of our sons is a lawyer, had several cousins and several uncles who were lawyers. I find the law extraordinarily interesting, and I'm looking forward as you are to tonight's lecture. I also had the very real privilege of knowing and working with Dorothy Thompson. Dorothy also was a lawyer, lawyer in the field of academic law, which is for the most part personnel law. And uh, I was her most prolific client. I had a well-worn path from my office to hers, and I found her to be a source of extraordinary wise counsel and legal expertise who had the unique uh, knack of being able to put the politics, the canon law, and the civil law that characterize the university environment together into one package. And in doing that, she rendered an immensely valuable service to Kansas State University uh, over a very long period of time. Actually, first as uh, as director of the Office of Affirmative Action and subsequently as associate counsel for Kansas State University. And this is the 19th in a series of lectures uh, held in uh, her memory. Our speaker tonight, Stephen Jones, practices law in Enid, Oklahoma. And I can tell you, he can tell stories with the best of the open. I can vouch for that. He was admitted to the Oklahoma Bar in 1966, and in 1995, he accepted a request from the United States District Court to serve as the defense counsel for Timothy McVeigh, the man also known as the Oklahoma City Bomber. Mr. Jones did this out of a strong personal conviction that it's the constitutional responsibility of a lawyer to accept cases, even though they may be controversial and unpopular, and in this case, in the extreme, and to defend any such client to the best of his ability. And certainly, Mr. Jones' client, Timothy McVeigh, was referred by some as the most hated man in America, maybe the most hated man in the world. While defending McVeigh, Mr. Jones literally had to put his law practice on hold for two and a half years. The McVeigh defense cost more than $20 million and involved 35 lawyers as far as the defense team. Early in his career, Mr. Jones served as a personal research assistant for former President Richard Nixon. In 1964, and as legal counsel to Oklahoma Governor Dewey Bartlett in 1967. In 1990, as a Republican nominee for the U.S. Senate in Oklahoma. He served as general counsel of the Oklahoma chapter of the ACLU and has defended numerous individuals with regard to freedom of speech cases, many of which were on university campuses. An author, Mr. Jones, as you've already heard, is uh, wrote with Peter Israel, Others Unknown, the Oklahoma City Bombing Case and Conspiracy, which was about the defense of Timothy McVeigh and the story surrounding the roots of that tragedy with which we're all, all too familiar. A new edition has been recently published, and that's the edition that's here, which includes considerable new information that for reasons Mr. Jones uh, may tell us were not available in the first edition. The title of tonight's lecture is Representing a Terrorist in Court. Please join me in welcoming our 19th Dorothy Thompson Civil Rights Lecture Series speaker, Mr. Stephen Jones. Thank you, Father.
<clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, first let me thank you for taking off on a uh, night of class and work to come and hear my presentation, and I hope that it will be worthy of your attention and your efforts. Secondly, I want to tell you that it is particularly gratifying to me to come to Kansas and especially to this campus. One of my sons was a student here uh, several years ago and I had the opportunity at that time of speaking with your president by telephone who actually called my office and spoke with me concerning my son Edward. And uh, I remember his personal attention and interest and I am particularly grateful to the people of the state of Kansas and to the Kansas Bar for the help that they gave me when I was representing Mr. McVeigh. As you can imagine, the subject of my talk is not popular in Oklahoma. In fact, in the seven years since the bombing and my appointment, I have only been invited to speak to three groups of lawyers in the entire state of Oklahoma and probably not more than half a dozen civic organizations on the bombing. I don't take that as any kind of personal affront. <clears throat> it's just that in Oklahoma, it is a very painful subject. But Kansas, the place where the bombing was at least planned in part to carry out in Oklahoma based upon an incident in Texas, gave me comfort and aid in a very unpleasant and unhappy task, but <clears throat> pardon me, one that I was required to take on. So it's very difficult for me to resist any invitation from the state of Kansas. Because of what I'm going to say tonight in the more formal part, I want to tell you that I'm able to share some of this information with you because Mr. McVeigh waived the attorney-client privilege. The privilege survives death. It does not, however, survive 75 hours of tape-recorded interviews with two Buffalo, New York police reporters writing a book with an advance of half a million dollars. Much of what Mr. McVeigh said, and which is in the book, was an attack on his defense team, and under the existing canons of the Bar Association, uh, we are entitled to defend ourselves, and I was so advised by the general counsel of the Bar. I will try to speak with restraint on that subject, but it may nevertheless come up. About 10 days ago, as I was preparing the remarks for tonight, I had to set aside my papers and take care of another task. I was preparing the final shipment of material to a place in another state where I knew that they could be preserved in perpetuity in safe condition. And the last item that I sent was a box. Inside the box are 168 folders. They contain five to seven photographs each of the people who died at the Murrah building and in the surrounding neighborhood that morning. In life, I did not know them. In death, I know them intimately. I know their stories. I know the hour of their death, the cause of their death. I know their families. I had the opportunity to see some of them in court, and of course their life stories were put on in an abbreviated form, but that's all that could be done for the jury. And of course to that group of 168 has been added my own client, the 169th. So I come to you tonight, I hope, with humility for recognizing the terrible cost of what was then the largest act of domestic terrorism in the history of the United States. For until I took up the defense of Mr. McVeigh, no American lawyer had ever been asked to defend someone accused of murdering over a hundred of his fellow citizens in so terrible a way. Between 10.11 and 10.12 Central Time on the morning of April the 19th, 1995, all of the major television networks in the United States interrupted their regular programming. The first was Dan Rather, and this is what he told the American people. 
The Oklahoma City Police Department has confirmed to CBS News that shortly after 9 a.m. this morning, Central Daylight Time, a little more than an hour ago, a car truck bomb said to be of unusual force and strength was detonated and exploded in downtown Oklahoma City directly in front of a nine-story federal office building where more than 500 people are employed. The building and much of the surrounding business district is said to be completely destroyed. A general fire alarm is sounding now throughout Oklahoma City as frantic rescue and recovery efforts are underway to locate survivors. The mayor has acknowledged that Oklahoma City has sustained a stage one disaster. The city's hospitals have gone to a code black for the emergency with the largest, St. Anthony's, owned by the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City, releasing all patients in any way ambulatory in order to make way for those injured. It has asked its sister hospital, Mercy, owned and operated by the Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus Christ, to stand by for the emergency. The University of Oklahoma's Children's Hospital has been closed to further admissions. The American Red Cross has sent out an urgent plea for blood donations. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has just announced that it is investigating the crime of a detonation of a weapon of mass destruction this morning in Oklahoma City. Shortly before 10 a.m., Oklahoma's Governor Frank Keating activated the entire National Guard to full service and ordered it to be sent to the beleaguered city. The Department of Justice has just announced that a second and third explosive device have been found. The Commissioner of Public Safety has ordered the immediate evacuation of the entire downtown business, residential, and commercial sections of Oklahoma City. Air raid sirens are now being heard in the metropolitan area. The President of the United States and the Governor of Oklahoma are said to be conferring at this hour by telephone. CBS interrupts and postpones indefinitely all regular scheduled commercial broadcasting in order that we may bring you live coverage via satellite of this unprecedented and tragic event. CBS is now joined by its 568 affiliates throughout the world who will identify themselves for their local audiences. This is a CBS News special report, April the 19th, 1995, the Oklahoma City bombing, terror in the heartland. One week following that, the nation observed a one-minute silence for the dead of Oklahoma City. On Sunday following the bombing, 12,000 people attended the memorial funeral service which the President and Mrs. Clinton attended along with Governor and Mrs. Keating, who entered as the great choir sang, O sore head, now wounded. What I'm going to show you are excerpts from a video documentary prepared by the BBC. It has never been shown in the United States in its entirety. It's been shown in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Great Britain, and wherever the BBC World Service by television reaches. This is just 10 minutes that I have excerpt to give you a flavor of this remarkable video and the Oklahoma City bombing. So I'm ready now if you're ready.
did break down because it was the boy next door on trial for murder. I had a job to do. My job was to defend him, to represent him. Knowing that I was defending the man who had told me he was guilty. Tim saw himself as a rescuer. He believed that he was preventing a greater harm. Not a martyr, a patriot. The type of man who would believe that 50 years from now, his statue would be on the mall in Washington. government and his belief that individual liberties were under threat were increasingly dominating his thoughts. There began a slow descent into paranoia. Patriotic paranoia, but paranoia nonetheless. I knew at the time this was an enormously complicated individual. Conflicted. Conflicted. Um, Manipulative. Uh, a man who described himself as having a code of honor when it was a selective code. The Oklahoma bomb exploded on the second anniversary of Waco. Stephen Jones argues that the bombing was part of a much wider conspiracy against the government. Somewhere, someone, and I think I know who that someone is. saw what a wonderful killing machine this could be. A man who would throw himself on the sword and leave everybody else obscured. That at the end, there would only be, as Agatha Christie said, one little Indian left standing. Tim was hesitant to tell us certain things. He lied to us from the very beginning by sending in lawyers every day to talk to him, by going over his story repeatedly. 
he knew that he was not always telling it consistently, which would mean, he thought, truthfully, that I would begin to pick out the inconsistencies and realize he was lying to me. Obviously, in view of the events of September the 11th of 2001, Mr. Hartzler's hope that there would never be such a terrible crime again 
went unrealized, as did my own aspirations, which I spoke of. On the evening of May the 5th, 1995, at about 9.30 in the evening, I was walking through my house from the second floor to the first floor before retiring for the night. I lived north of Enid. It was a typical spring night such as we know in Kansas and Oklahoma with blustery winds, rain, hail, and lightning. The lights were out on the first floor and I did not turn them on when I heard the phone ring because I knew my way in my own home. I entered the library and I picked up the telephone and heard a voice as though speaking to me from a great distance say to me, Mr. Stephen Jones, to which I replied, yes. And the voice said, Mr. Jones, this is the Department of Justice Watch Command Center in Washington, D.C. Please stay on the line for Chief Judge Russell from Oklahoma City. Instinctively, I reached for a pencil and a pad, and then I heard the familiar voice of David Russell, whom I had known for 30 years. The voice in Washington said, Your Honor, this is a secure line. Mr. Jones is on the telephone. Judge Russell came right to the point, and after exchanging a brief greeting, said, We've had a conversation among ourselves, the other judges, and myself, and we have a question we want to ask you. And the question is, would you agree to represent an individual who has been or will be charged with the Oklahoma City bombing? I thought for a moment and said to him, I have no professional problem with it. I understand what you are trying to do. And although I have certainly been in controversial cases before, I've never been in one in which I thought that my wife or my home or my family or children or my associates or even the building where I practice law would be at risk. And I think in fairness to them, I should discuss it with them first before I answer your question. He said that would be agreeable. We spent a few more minutes talking and he gave me kind of a general background. He didn't say who he had under consideration as other lawyers or even if I agreed whether I would be appointed, much less as to which person I would represent. I told him I would call him back in 24 hours with my answer. And on that note, we parted. After Judge Russell hung up, I remember turning around in the chair in the library and looking out the window to the garden that my wife had prepared over the years. And I thought back to the day when I was seven years old and I had been standing outside my parents' apartment in Houston, Texas when the ground had shook beneath my feet, the windows had rattled and I heard a large boom. Fifty to sixty miles away, the Flying Dutchman a merchant ship had blown up in the harbor of Texas City, Texas, loaded with tons of ammonia nitrate fertilizer. The explosion killed over 560 Texans, including all of the 23 members of the Texas City Fire Department. Ammonia nitrate was said at that time to be the ingredient in the Oklahoma City bomb. I remember that when I was 19 years old and about to go away to the University of Oklahoma, I had spent the summer working for a funeral home in Houston where I had grown up, and we were in an ambulance returning from some routine transfer at the Texas Medical Center when the police radio came on and said that we were dispatched to the Edgar Allan Poe Elementary School where there had been some type of explosion. Because I had spent four of my six years at the Poe Elementary School, I knew precisely where it was. So I told the driver to go up two blocks and turn left and go back one block and then one block south or some such description. And we turned on the red lights and we were there in a matter of 30 or 45 seconds. When we arrived, there was no indication of any emergency. There was no other firefighting equipment or ambulances. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. We thought it was a false alarm. We got out of the ambulance to go inside to be sure. When all of a sudden, Martin Kelly, who was the driver, yelled out, look. And as I turned to look where he was pointing, 
a little boy, eight or nine or ten years old, came staggering around the corner of the Poe Elementary School, covered in blood, his right arm blown off. On that morning, a man from Seminole, Oklahoma, had come on to the Poe grounds and detonated a bomb, killing a number of students and faculty members. And I knew that 19 children under the age of six had died at the Murrah Building. As I thought on these things, I still hadn't turned on the lights. My wife came home. She had been out for the evening. When she came in the back door, I hollered out to her. I said, uh, Booter, one of my nicknames for her, I said, could you come in here a minute? I have something to tell you. And she came in the library, and the first thing she said was, why are the lights off? I ignored her question and said, Raider, another nickname for her. The call that you were afraid would come has come. And my wife said, because she had some premonition I would be called, I had no such premonition, nor had I asked to be considered, nor did I even think an Oklahoma lawyer would be appointed. I assumed it would be a federal public defender from out of state. And she looked at me and said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, what we are going to do is to sit down and discuss it as husband and wife and come to a decision after talking with the children. So we did. We talked. We never did turn the lights on. We talked about my obligations as a lawyer, what it would mean to us as husband and wife, what the children would feel, what my mother, who's quite elderly then, would feel, what it would mean for our own security. Could we continue to live where we were? Could we even continue to live in Oklahoma? And what would happen to me when it was over with? Would there be a practice to come back to? We simply did not know. We then called each of my children, each of our children, and then the next morning I began to call people whose judgment I valued and who I knew would hold my confidence and get their opinion. Last person I called was Governor Frank Keating, who was my client. I was his special counsel, and I represented Frank and Kathy Keating on political and personal matters, and I felt it appropriate to discuss it with him. He was against it, as you might imagine. And I got a little pompous. I said, well, Governor, you're a lawyer. I mean, you United States Attorney, number three in the Department of Justice. You were nominated for the Tenth Circuit. Surely you understand that every man is entitled to a lawyer when he's charged with a crime. And he said, oh, damn it. He said, I know that. He's just not entitled to my lawyer. <laughs> so I took that as a kind of a good-natured compliment and uh, thanked him. And at that point, I called Judge Russell back. And when he came on the line, I repeated to him the question that he asked me formally. I said, in response to your question, would I agree to represent someone charged or about to be charged in the Oklahoma City bombing? The answer is yes. And it was almost as though a great burden had been taken from his shoulders, and, and uh, he said, great. I appoint you to represent Timothy James McVeigh, be in my chambers at 1.30 Monday afternoon. I was fortunate to have a weekend to consider what I should do, how I should do it, and what I should try to avoid. So on Monday, with my daughter and two of my colleagues, I drove to Oklahoma City. The secret had held. We parked. We walked past the Murrah building. The fence that we are all familiar with was there with the poems and the pictures and the teddy bears. The Murrah building was still standing. The outer perimeter was patrolled by the National Guard. And behind the fence, the FBI was shifting through evidence, and the medical examiner was still recovering bodies and body parts. We went into the United States Courthouse, which was about 1,000 feet from ground zero. No one took any special notice of my comings and goings. We went up to the judge's chambers. I went in. There was a very small and brief ceremony as he appointed me. And then he asked everyone to leave but me. When they had left, he went over and shut the door. He came over to where I was sitting. I stood up. He smiled and extended his hand and said, Well, Stephen, 
I hope I haven't signed your death warrant. And I said, David, the only time he'd been a judge, I'd spoken to him with his Christian name, said, I can assure you that makes two of us. He smiled again, said, well, good luck to you. He said, the warden, I mean, the marshal is outside ready to take you to meet your new client. So in the company of the United States Marshal, I traveled 30 miles west to the federal prison in El Reno where I met the warden. We went through some very elaborate security. I went down with the warden and the marshals a long hall, made a sharp turn to the right, walked into a secure room, and there was a young man sitting in khakis, tall, thin, close shaven. He stood up. I walked over to him, extended my hand, and I said, Mr. McVeigh, my name is Stephen Jones. I'm a lawyer from Enid, Oklahoma. I've been appointed to represent you. He shook my hand and said, I heard you were coming. At that point, I'm sure as the marshals and the warden withdrew, they heard my first question to Mr. McVeigh, which was, why don't you sit down for a minute and tell me something about yourself? From that moment on, for the next two and a half years, I was Tim McVeigh's principal defense attorney. It was my duty to accept the appointment. At the time that it was tendered to me, I was 55 years old. I had been practicing law for more than a quarter of a century. As you heard, I've been the Republican nominee for the United States Senate and also Attorney General. I had worked for a man who became President of the United States. And I had a number of wonderful clients, from widows and orphans who invest in insurance companies to the average Joe Blow on the street. And I lived to practice law and to be with my family. But when I was 29 or 30, I had been asked, I was actually the 13th lawyer to be asked, to defend Keith Green. Keith Green was an OU student, much like many of you today who had carried a homemade Viet Cong flag and disrupted an ROTC weekly drill the day after the Kent State incident at Kent, Ohio, where four students had been killed by the National Guard, where they had demonstrated in reaction to President Nixon's military action in Cambodia. Keith was charged with the crime of carrying a flag of disloyalty, and I agreed to represent him. He paid me. There was no conflict of interest. He had a defense. I told my partner, older man, that I had that red flag case down at Norman. Now, in hindsight, his idea of what a red flag case was at Norman was probably a little different than mine. So when the news came out that I was representing Keith, Mr. Carter insisted that I drop the case or resign from the firm. I did not think that that was appropriate for me to drop the case, and I told him so. So we parted amicably, or so I thought. After I had left the next day, he sent out about 5,000 press releases announcing my resignation, making it clear what had led to my resignation. It became a media sensation in Oklahoma. That was my announcement that I was going into the private practice of law. At that time, I was single, probably didn't know anything except a small mortgage and, and on my car. I was single, and I didn't have much in the way of responsibility. So it was fairly easy to be virtuous. Twenty-five years later, I was middle-aged. My journey was more than half over. I had a position, a presence, if you will, in the community. Obligations at the bank and everywhere else, children in college, and so forth. But I recognized that had I said no, it would have meant that all of the speeches that I had given, all the CLE seminars, all the things that I had written about the duty of lawyers to take controversial and unpopular cases, to accept appointments from the court willingly, had been a lie, and I was not prepared to admit that. So I accepted the appointment. And when I did so, I told the judge on the telephone, I'm not going to do this with one arm tied behind my back. 
I'm going to do it zealously, and I'm going to try to kick the government's ass every morning and every day, in every way. My job was to see that nothing was taken from Tim McVeigh, neither his life nor his liberty, except by due process of law. And if the government could not convince the jury under the law and under the evidence that he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and he was acquitted, so be it. I had done my job. That's what I understood. And I didn't have any second thoughts about it. No one had drafted me to law school. No one had come into my apartment and kidnapped me. And when I gained consciousness, I was in Torts 1 at Molette Hall. I became a lawyer because I wanted to be a lawyer. And under those circumstances, I fully understood what my professional obligation was, recognizing that in this unique circumstance, there were situations in which advocacy could make one vulnerable to physical death or professional death. Whether I succeeded, I leave for others to decide. I was asked to defend a man, and the provost referred to him as the most hated man in America. I do not know whether that is true. It was certainly true in Oklahoma. I was to defend him zealously and live in the community in the state where 168 people had been murdered. Six sets of husband and wives, three sets of brothers and sisters, one mother and son. The bomb killed the soon to be wed, the newly wed, aunts, uncles, mothers, fathers, one woman testified at the trial that her 10-year-old son wanted to die and go to heaven because he could be with Papa. 500 people injured, blind, disfigured, deaf, loss of a limb or memory. Over 47,000 Oklahomans sought the intervention of emotional or psychological counseling. A billion dollars worth of property damage. So great was the bomb, so great was the bomb that over 200 buildings had to be destroyed and the skyline of Oklahoma City is today different than it was at nine o'clock on the morning of April the 19th. That was my responsibility. I assembled a team, and we went to work. We examined over 150,000 photographs, 500 hours of videotape, over 400 hours of audio tape. We read over 33,000 FBI witness statements. We examined dozens, hundreds of hospital and medical records important and sensitive information, an opportunity to meet the Attorney General of the United States, to become familiar with some of the most advanced intelligence gathering and law enforcement techniques available in this country, to see photographs taken of Oklahoma City and rural areas of this part of Kansas from satellites in space. And if it is true, and it is true, that I had breakfast with Peter Jennings and lunch at 21 with Tom Brokaw and dinner at Four Seasons with Dan Rather and tea with Barbara Walters in her elegant apartment overlooking Fifth Avenue, it is also true that I met some of the most bizarre, paranoid, and fanatical people on the face of the earth. Our efforts to represent Mr. McVeigh took us to lean-to shacks in the Philippines, rural co-op elevators here in Kansas, to the precincts of the Jerusalem and Tel Aviv police station, to the cloisters of King's College London, to the national headquarters of the Israeli police, to one of the sites of the leading terrorist events in the Middle East, the King David Hotel, which was nearly destroyed in 1948, 
by a group headed by Menachem Begin. And in doing all of this and going all of these places, we traveled by foot, by automobile, once on camel, by car, by limousine, by jeep, by private jet, by 747 jumbo jets and air buses all over the world. I myself went to Manila, Hong Kong, Korea, the Philippines, Macau, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Germany, the occupied territories on the West Bank, Israel, Jordan, and Syria, all in the search for evidence that would assist and exculpate our client. And I think he did receive a zealous defense, notwithstanding his criticism. We were able to secure a change of venue out of Oklahoma City to Colorado. We were able to disqualify the Oklahoma City federal judges. We obtained a severance of the trial from Terry Nichols. We suppressed some of the most damaging evidence against Tim McVeigh. The judge authorized us to have an unprecedented three weeks of individual voir dire with members of the jury and ultimately funded the defense to the total of $20 million in comparison to $86.9 million spent by the federal government. Although the jury ultimately convicted Mr. McVeigh and he was demonized in the media, I am convinced that Judge Mage thought he was giving Mr. McVeigh a fair trial. That was our job. He told me he was guilty. He has since acknowledged that he was involved. He has said that he told me. But I still have the obligation to present whatever defense, whatever interpretation of the law and the facts to the jury. I would not be his Dr. Kevorkian. I would not help him commit legal suicide. I would not go about it half-hearted. <clears throat> I had to say things and do things and be disingenuous in the representation of Tim McVeigh, a man who won the Bronze Star for service and two Army Commendation Medals with an upgrade to valor. And perhaps the most remarkable thing about Tim McVeigh is that even after he was convicted, even after the jury said he caused this terrible carnage Forty-four people came to Denver to testify under oath to try to save his life. You saw two of them, the McDermott's, the next-door neighbors. Girlfriends, co-workers, army buddies, teachers, students, neighbors, family members, his mother and father. When Terry Nichols sentencing stage came, almost nobody came to Denver, and he was acquitted of murder. So Tim McVeigh's soul and spirit had redeeming value. Though the deed that he was convicted of was evil, it is not our position to judge him. When the trial was over, I remember that one of my associates asked me, boss, how will we know whether we succeeded? And I said, we will be able to go home again and live as we did before. And he said, and if we fail, well, I said, that's easy. The Oklahoma Bar Association will give us an award. We were able to go home. I live today where I lived before. I am conscious that every word I speak and everything that I write will be reviewed and criticized, whether by bar associations or judges or fellow lawyers or national associations. But I tell you sincerely, and it wasn't easy for me to come to this conclusion, in the final analysis, I could not please everybody. So it became only important if I was satisfied that I had done the right thing. For a long period of time, 
I did not think it would ever be possible for me to explain why I had done some things or not done other things until Tim McVeigh decided to go public against my advice, against the advice of every other lawyer that he had. A man so willing to die to protect others that he would dismiss his appeals. He would be alive today but for that dismissal. But to Tim, and many things may be said about Tim McVeigh, but he was never a coward. During the desert storm, most people around him wanted to be in his tank because they realized that was the safest place to be. His views and his values, not his version of the facts, are entitled to my respect. He was, after all, my client. The second goal that I had was simply this. If I could survive professionally, socially, economically, if I could return to Oklahoma and resume my practice, no matter what the cost, then no other lawyer could ever legitimately or intellectually honestly say, I can't take this case because I have to live here. Well, let me tell you, if you can represent somebody that's convicted of killing 168 Oklahomans and live in Enid, Oklahoma, seven years later, then you can do it anywhere in this country. And I take satisfaction from the fact that since 9-11, to my knowledge, no lawyer has turned down an appointment to represent anyone associated in those cases unless they had a direct disqualifying as a conflict of interest, which is only natural. That's their duty to take themselves out of it, but not on false reasons. I am sometimes asked, and I conclude on this note, what did I learn? Well, I have to tell you that the first thing that I learned was the strength of prayer and faith. Because on the morning I went down to see Judge Mache or Judge Russell, I went to the Episcopal Church where I had served as senior warden and usher and member of the vestry in every position but member of the choir, thank goodness. And I prostrated myself before the altar alone with the prayer and the hope that I would not be found wanting if the occasion demanded. That was my third goal. I had the benefit of having three wonderful judges, the last of whom Judge Mach earned my admiration as a fair man. Gary Cooper in black robes, I think I referred to him as. He was determined, as he saw it, to give Tim McVeigh a fair trial. One could not walk into Judge Mach's courtroom without figuratively squaring your shoulders and recognizing that you were fortunate to be in this man's room. And then the reasons why. Why Oklahoma City? Why the Murrah Building? And those unfolded slowly. I am a conservative Republican. True, I was general counsel for the ACLU, but I don't see an inconsistency there. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not one, I hope, that makes irresponsible charges. But I told Tim McVeigh that I understood, I could not agree with it, but I understood why he had acted. And in time, I became convinced of two things. That the government of the United States committed terrible crimes at Mount Carmel in February to April of 1993. Terrible crimes. At best, reckless indifference to human life, and at worst, cold-blooded murder of innocent men, women, and children. And secondly, that the United States was the most hated country in the world. And that from everything we saw in the McVeigh case, I knew that there would be others. I said as much. And one reporter said, do you think there will be other terrorist acts? And I said, yes, but not until Tim McVeigh is executed. September the 11th was the 90th day 
following his execution. And everything that has occurred and come out since then only confirms and strengthens the argument that I made in the book. The argument that the government hid evidence from us, that witnesses perjured themselves, the evidence of a possible foreign connection, and that there were already the forces of hate and evil gathering to strike us. Tim McVeigh died, or, or the people at Oklahoma City died, on April the 19, 1995. At approximately the same hour that the government was putting a certain form of gas banned in warfare into the frame buildings at Mount Carmel. They're on the same interstate, less than four and a half hours apart. 168 dead in Oklahoma City, 91 dead at Mount Carmel. They're a reverse of the same coin. They are dead and we are left alive. But in truth, they are not dead. For as always, the spirit of the dead survive in the memory of the living. Thank you.